Welcome everyone to the webinar on tools for success in today's biodiesel market. My name is Gerald Kootenay. I'm the Executive Vice President and the Director of the Emerging Technologies Group of Lee Enterprises Consulting. I'm filling in for Wayne Lee, the CEO of our group, who sends his apologies for missing this event. Lee Enterprises Consulting is the world's largest alternative and renewable fuels consulting group with experts in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. We have in-depth expertise in all aspects of biodiesel, ethanol, solar, wind, and emerging technologies. We also maintain ongoing strategic relationships with the industry's top law firms, accounting groups, engineering groups, technology providers, and fabrication facilities. We have five teams. Biodiesel, ethanol, emerging technologies, wind solar, and business financial. We have over 50 experts from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds. Here is a list of our services, which of course I don't expect you to read, and it's not complete in any case, as every day we get unique requests on a daily basis. If you go to our website, you will see a list of services under each division. In addition to the consultants, we have a number of strategic alliances with leading businesses in the sector, including Genscape, FC Stone, Tanaska, Murex, ICM, ERI, and IMA Insurance. We also have two large law firms and two accounting firms and some manufacturing groups that are within our group. The bottom line is that we provide a full spectrum of services for new projects and established facilities alike. In any kind of alternative or renewable project or facility, we aim to be the first call from our clients. Today's webinar is being brought to you by our biodiesel division, headed by Susan Olson of Genscape, who will be your host for today's call. And we would like to thank Genscape for putting this together for us. During the presentations, if you have questions, please fill in the mark box at the bottom of the, of the slide, mark Q&A. These questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time, the experts will get back to you by email after the presentations are over. And today's speakers include Scott Bunce, assessing the economics of the industry, Jake Moline, filling in for Nate Burke on locking in forward margins, Kathy Rain, Hey, Caitlin, this is Susan Olson. Can, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, sorry, everybody, for the cut in there. I think we lost Gerald there, so I just uh, wanted to uh, – uh, I'm sure he was introducing me in the, pa in the pause there. I I'm Susan Olson. I'll be your host today. I just want to thank Wayne and uh, Lee Enterprises and Gerald for inviting Genscape here today. Um, my, my background is in research and development, and, and I'm the VP of Biofuels here at, at Genscape. So uh, I'll be the host, so I'll just be introducing the speakers as they, uh, as they come along here, and uh, also be speaking myself a little bit during the talk today. So without um, further ado, I thought I would go ahead and, and introduce our, our first speaker today, uh, Scott Buns uh, from, from Tanaska Commodities. He's got uh, a lot of experience in business development and risk management and, and trading, and he's going to share some of the expertise with us today related to, to biodiesel. He's some very exciting information to present to everyone today, talking about margins and feedstocks and, and the real nuts and bolts of, of how the, the pricing uh, and uh, value gets put together. So he's worked with uh, some, some great firms, Conagra and Gavilon, before he came to Tanaska, and, and has a lot of experience with a variety of different commodities. So, so with that, Scott, I'll uh, flip it over to you to get started on your talk today. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for, for Lee Enterprises for putting this together along with, with you guys today. I uh, 
I think I might have possibly drawn the short straw out of this one because there are exciting things to talk about in biodiesel, but it's also a, a very challenging environment. So uh, there's some there's some difficult things going on in the industry, but there's a few few lights at the end of the tunnel as well that we'll we'll get to here in a couple of minutes. But really, the thing with uh, biodiesel is that it's driven by many different uh, moving parts of, of the industry of the uh, commodity markets. You've got Energy prices, uh, which are a main driver of our, our final product. You've got imported biodiesel, uh, looking at the economics of the world industry. RINs prices and LCFS credits are a, a complicated portion of what we do. Biggest driver is feedstock prices, uh, the varying feedstocks that can go into biodiesel. Uh, then you've got things like policy, the RFS program and uh, a tax credit situation as we we've, we've been aware that you know the tax credit has expired for the last 6 years and and then uh, you know has been retroacted as well so you know policy uncertainty and and many moving commodity pieces can make you know biodiesel a a, a challenging market to manage from a risk perspective The, the biggest driver for us in the marketplace today, and it has been for the last uh, the last year, is what's happened with crude oil and heating oil. Um, we have seen crude oil prices drop about 51% year to date. Uh, that has also driven down heating oil and uh, down about 42% year to date as well. And this is a a major change in the world. You know, fracking has been a, a game changer not only in the U.S. but for world oil prices, and U.S. production is now more certain than it than it's ever been. The reason this is all important is, you know, heating oil is a uh, really a, a, a key component in when you're managing margin for biodiesel, and and it's put a lot of pressure onto blend margins for the industry. You'll hear a lot of people talk about the BOHO spread. Uh, that's the spread between what soybean oil and heating oil is from a financial standpoint. I, I don't want to steal any of Jake's thunder that's coming up here next, but uh, if you look at this chart, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to interpret, but the higher the number, the, the less the margin is in the industry. We would prefer something below the zero mark. That would show that the, the feedstock is cheaper than the end product. Because um, biodiesel trades as a basis to these to a heating oil or ULSD, uh, the feedstocks are soybean oil or similar products, and, and typically the industry will use soybean oil to hedge its uh, the front end and the feedstock side. We spent a lot of time in negative territory this year for the producer, and typically you would see a D4 RIN or the biodiesel RIN offset a higher uh, spread on the on the boho, but this hasn't materialized this year because. Uh, plants have been running at, at uh, a higher pace than what the margins would, would say they might be. Um, in 2014, we had some time where this spread was, was favorable, but we have not seen it yet in 2015. Another big impact this year and going forward is going to be uh, uh, biodiesel imports. Uh, foreign competition has definitely increased. You know, Paul, Meth Paul Methyl Ester has been coming to the U.S. for several years. Uh, you can't generate a RIN from PME, but they've been able to take advantage of the biodiesel tax credit. Uh, but there's been some changes between European policy and U.S. policy and, and commodity economics for the feedstocks. Uh, we've seen a lot of Argentinian biodiesel move to the U.S. Uh, this year as well. Uh, Argentina incentivizes uh, bio exports through lower taxes that are you know, relative than what they can export their soybean oil for, and now the EPA has granted them the ability to generate a RIN. Uh, also, the U.S. dollar has been very strong versus the the Argentinian peso, and that that strength creates incentive for exports. There's estimates that up to 600 million gallons per year uh, can come in from Argentina. This year, we've seen about 260 million gallons through September. Uh, we expect that in Q4 we, we could accelerate that even more uh, as they try and take advantage of a potential retroactive uh, blender's tax credit. Another key component is RINs. Uh, obviously, if you look at this, this chart, the RINs have been volatile this year. Uh, we've got a little bit of 
uh, movement higher after the RFS came out with their new proposed numbers, but now we've uh, had a, a sharp fall since that time. Um, to this point, about 1.35 billion gallons of the 1.7 billion gallon 2015 mandate has been generated, and we're projecting somewhere around 1.85 to 1.9 being generated for 2015. That also means we'll have the ability to carry over some RINs versus the 2016 mandate. Uh, there's a relationship with the D4 RINs versus the D5s and D6s for uh, advanced and, and for ethanol. We're seeing some Brazilian ethanol imports uh, come into the U.S. now as well uh, and some cellulosic uh, production. That fills the total advanced bucket which uh, the biodiesel industry had hoped that biodiesel would fill more of that bucket, so so been some other imports affecting us there. Um, we have seen the D4s move higher recently. This chart's actually a little bit out of date. It's closer to uh, 60 on the RINs now. Um, we hear from the EPA that there will be adjustments uh, to the May 29th RVO proposal. I think the market is, one, anticipating the slightly higher numbers for the cellulosic and advanced category, and um, also, you know, potentially a little bit higher on biodiesel, whether they'll take imported volume into account from Argentina is yet to be seen. Feedstocks is the largest cost of a biodiesel plant. Uh, we've got four, four to five main feedstocks. Soybean oil, uh, which is uh, the largest. Distiller's corn oil has become more pronounced in the last several years. Uh, it's a good quality feedstock for people that can use it. Uh, use cooking oil and yellow grease, an abundant supply of that, um, can be variable in quality, and animal fats. And really, the, the different feedstocks, uh, you change usage based on price, but also on technology. Not every plant has the ability to use the distiller's corn oil or yuco or animal fats that are higher FFA, um, or the distillation technology maybe for a corn oil application. Uh, in this area, renewable diesel tends to be pretty, pretty flexible. They can use all of these products. Uh, soybean oil is still king. Uh, the integrated crushers slash biodiesel producers still use a lot of soybean oil. Um, the other areas, uh, corn oil and yuco and yellow, have been growing slightly as more plants put in the technology to be able to use them. Um, there are incentives to use these lower quality feedstocks because of price. This is a good indication of the overall price movement. We have seen uh, lower feedstock prices. You know, there's not a there's not a strong correlation between all of these different products, but in general, as soybean oil moves lower, so do the other products. Uh, there's a, a good U.S. soybean crop this year, a good harvest. Uh, we expect soybean oil ending stocks to be higher at year end. The unfortunate thing is that soybean oil prices haven't moved uh, uh, down as quickly as the biodiesel price has. With all that being said, our production is still fairly high. Uh, we're, we're maintaining a high pace this year. Basically what's happening is the, the well-capitalized plants continue to run even at a negative margin in anticipation of a retroactive tax credit coming back in. And we still have plenty of capacity in the industry to meet the mandates. Uh, we're only producing, uh, as you can see here, we've got the, the ability to go up over to close to 2 billion gallons and and we're not uh, we're not close to that today. So this leads to the biodiesel margin. Uh, we're spending an awful lot of time here around zero or or negative. It's it's not a very good picture when you take all these different factors into account. We've got about uh, 40 to 60 cents, you know, of plant cost depending on efficiency and size of the operation. So it's not an exact science, but uh, it, it's this all adds up to a, a fairly difficult environment that we've had. On the positive front, uh, LCFS, the California program, we've seen LCFS credits rise very quickly uh, here in the last few months. Uh, this chart also needs to be updated. We're closer to you know, 75 or $80 for the credits today. Um, the readoption of the California LCFS program has, has firmed the market out there. Obligated parties uh, seem to be taking note. They wanna, they're managing their business to the, to the policy. California is a huge market for biodiesel. Um, it appears that this LCFS program is, is going to stay in place and, and strong for years to come. We also see opportunities in Oregon, uh, Washington, and British Columbia. And this, this really could be a, a game changer future for the business out there as, 
as people, uh, as these local states uh, or lo the state governments take take these programs and co and continue to support them. Just for reference sake, an $80 LCFS credit can add up to about 95 cents a gallon on your biodiesel margin if you're using a, a corn oil with a 4CI. The downside is that uh, you'll still possibly see imports into the West Coast with even without a beet, uh, biodiesel tax, uh, blender's tax credit because uh, the LCFS credits are, are valuable. So just to kind of wrap up my piece here and, and keep us on time, you know, the outlook, we've got an abundance of commodities. You know, the good thing is we have abundance of commodities on feedstock, but uh, we also have an abundance of crude oil, thus heating oil, and, and so that's, that's going to be a challenge for the industry going forward. RFS, we, we finally look like we have some multi-year direction, uh, a little more uh, vision to that path than we've had in years past. Um, but everybody is wondering about the biodiesel tax credit. Um, my personal opinion is I think we get a retroactive tax credit this year. I think the industry believes we get a tax credit this year. Um, next year, I don't know. I, I would say that they will kick the can down the road again and, and probably not give us that. Should they do it, uh, the momentum for producers tax credit is, is there, and I think it's uh, – it's got significant momentum, and it would be a game changer for the industry. It would challenge the it would challenge the imports. And LCFS, uh, there there has been some some further calculations on the the values the that they use out there for the various feedstocks. It's leveled the playing field a little bit, um, but it's also helped firm the program overall and, and helped make it more long term. Uh, it's right now it's set to be a, a base uh, for the for the market going forward. Um, Hopefully, next time we do one of these, I will have a, a lot of great margin information to share and talk about how much money everybody's making. But I know we're going to have some questions at the end, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thanks a lot, Scott. I appreciate that. That's very helpful for you to share that that information with everybody today. Um, and uh, and we've had a couple of questions come through. Really, uh, we'd love to get questions from 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 our attendees today. Uh, that really helps us provide some color at the end of the presentation. So, if you have any questions related to Scott's presentation that are on your mind now, go ahead and type those in. We'll answer those anonymously at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to all of them, don't worry. We'll answer them. Um, individuals will answer them from the panel today directly to the person that asked the question. So um, so next up we have F.C. Stone, and uh, and unfortunately Nate uh, was unable to make it today, but but we have Jake Moline here with us who is also a risk management consultant at F.C. Stone. He's been uh, at the firm for the past four years. He's helped a lot of biodiesel producers uh, help do their hedging. So, um, so Jake, I'd just like to uh, flip it over to you, and, and you can get started on your section of the panel. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I'd like to once again thank Lee Enterprises for asking us to participate here. I, I know Nate wanted to be here, but uh, he's got a pretty important life moment going on here, uh, the birth of his uh, second and third daughters, uh, actually. So very uh, important thing to, to be uh, present for, thus, uh, you know, me filling in here for him. I. Uh, have been working here at FC Stone for about four years. Used to be a little more involved in the biodiesel uh, portion of the business, um, but still uh, have a, a pretty good idea of the fundamentals and mechanics of, of how we like to look at hedging for plants, and that's kind of what we're going to walk through, more the mechanics side of this thing, uh, as Scott kind of alluded to in the, in the previous uh, few slides here. There's uh, numerous factors in, in determining biodiesel margins, and there's no shortage of volatility. Uh, that's kind of where we like to pride ourselves on is, is taking away a little bit of that risk uh, for the plant. And uh, we're just going to get through uh, some of the terms here. Got our uh, disclaimer. These uh, first few slides here, uh, terminology, we're not going to walk through this. This will be available after the presentation. Uh, but as I'm walking through, you know, if we're going through any of these terms and you, and you have a question on, on what that means, we do like to look at things in terms of a hobo spread rather than a boho, meaning a positive margin would indicate a uh, positive net margin back to the plant. We're going to walk through a few of the uh, 
different ways that you can lock in a biodiesel mar uh, margin. There's basically two different uh, ways of thought here when it comes to protecting or, or not protecting against swings in the market. You can either stay open to the market, be a market taker. Uh, in that case, you're willing to let it ride uh, on a daily basis uh, and take whatever margin the market were to give to you. We like to uh, approach things more as a market maker where you lock in forward mar margins via hedging futures and uh, give yourself a little bit of a budget to work with. Uh, we're going to walk through exactly how to do that. There's basically two main pieces to a, a biodiesel margin, and that's the product or biodiesel in the, in the feedstock, usually soybean oil. Uh, but as Scott said, there's various different feedstocks involved. can all be hedged, though. Uh, we're gonna, first example we're going to walk through is an example where uh, a plant can sell flat price biodiesel for two months forward, but is unable to lock in the flat price feedstock for two months forward. Uh, in this example, they can buy soybean oil from a soy crush plant for one month out forward, but past that, and this is a common thing in the industry, uh, crush plants, feedstock traders, prefer to sell as a basis to soybean oil further than one month out. Uh, for that reason, um, you know, you have to incorporate futures into your hedging plan. So we've got uh, a million gallons a month of biodiesel here sold at uh, 275 for the next two months. The soy crush plant is willing to sell us one month of soybean oil at 28 cents per pound. Nearby soybean oil futures are trading at 27 cents per pound, and the soy crush plant offers to sell you one cent over basis uh, for the second month here. We're going to utilize operating cost of 60 cents a gallon here uh, to lock in margins for the two-month trip. I apologize there for the, the dog. I don't know who that is. If you could please mute your phone. Um, to lock in margins for the two-month strip, we're going to have the biodiesel producer book that one cent over basis with the soy crush plant uh, for month two. Simultaneously, we're going to need to go long futures in order to protect against that price from rising higher. So we've got a million gallons of biodiesel, seven and a half uh, pounds a gallon there of the feedstock equals 7.5 million, divided by 60,000, which is the contract size of a soybean oil futures and uh, that equals 125 contracts. We would go long 125 contracts, and by booking that basis, we've essentially locked in a flat price feedstock. Slide here. So we've got uh, the, the, the transaction here where we, we sold the biodiesel, uh, bought the flat price soybean oil, and went long 125 contracts of soybean oil at a one cent over basis. Uh, by doing this, we've essentially locked in a margin here. You got the 275 minus the 28 cents per pound times 7.5 plus the 60 equals 5 cents a gallon net margin. Uh, to flat price the, month, the second month of soybean oil, uh, Basically, what we would do is exchange futures ahead of the uh, month of delivery, so say five days prior to the start of the month two. If the market were to trade five cents higher from the time of the futures and basis were locked in to the time they price month two, the producer would pay 33 cents for the physical soybean oil. At the same time the physical soybean oil is priced for month two, the producer would liquidate or sell the futures contract, uh, oftentimes exchange and collect five cents a pound. We're going to look at how that plays out and how the, the physical and financial positions would offset each other. So here we've got uh, cash soybean oil at 28 cents a pound in October. The futures at 27 cents a pound. The basis won over as we, as we spoke about. By the time December rolls around, we've got the cash soybean oil at 33 cents a pound. The futures are now at 32. So we have a five cent a uh, physical loss that's completely offset by the five cent financial gain. Same principle here on the on the biodiesel side. Let's uh, look at an example where a plant is able to book in physical soybean oil for the full two months out forward, but unable to sell their biodiesel for the second month. So we've bought a thousand gallons a month or 
uh, 15 million pounds of soybean oil at 28 cents for two months. The biodiesel offtake will buy the first month at 275 flat price, uh, but for the second month, uh, they'll buy it at a buck 25 over heating oil or basis over heating oil. Biodiesel operating costs, once again, 60 cents a gallon here. Uh, we're going to go through this example a little bit quicker, but uh, instead of going long futures, we're going to sell heating oil futures to protect against the price from going down. I'm going to move to the next slide here. You can see in the equation down below here, we've got the 275 minus the 28 times 7.5 plus the 60. Same margin here. Uh, yeah. Just like with the soybean oil, you'll uh, exchange futures or liquidate your hedge prior to that month of delivery. We're going to look at how that looks here uh, in the example. So in October, we've got cash biodiesel at 275, the futures at 250. Um, Buck 25 over. December, 255 cash, futures at 230. Uh, we've got a, a net physical loss of 20 cents, completely offset by the physical gain of 20 cents. Uh, and then as we kind of move into our next speaker here, uh, financing, uh, margining a hedge position can add up here. Uh, which brings in the importance of having a, a financing program in place. A soybean oil, the initial margin is $950 a contract. Uh, once again, the contract size for soybean oil is 60,000 pounds. Heating oil, $5,200 a contract for a 42,000 gallon contract. Maintenance margin slightly lower here, uh, which would come into play for most often for, for hedgers as well. Uh, would utilize the maintenance margin rather than the initial margin. $600 a contract or $400 and $20 a contract for the heating oil. Uh, we've got some helpful tables here uh, that uh, explain the capital requirements for hedging soybean oil. So in this example, uh, we've got the million gallons, once again, or 7,500,000 pounds of uh, feedstock usage. That's 125 contracts at the $950 uh, for initial margin. Uh, you can see what it would cost to hedge 100% of your production all the way down to 25. And then for every penny per pound move in that soybean oil futures, that's the uh, incremental additional margin that would be required. Uh, so you can see that you know with volatile markets, this can add up quickly. Same thing on the uh, biodiesel side. Uh, this time we're looking at 24 contracts to hedge 100% uh, of your million gallons there. You've got uh, just under $125,000 in initial margin for every uh, five cent move in heating oil. You're looking at about another 50,000 uh, in a maintenance margin that's required uh, that uh, the market goes against you there. So definitely something that costs a lot of money to hedge, but as we showed in the previous examples, completely offset by either a physical gain uh, if you have a financial loss or if you had a uh, financial gain, that would be offset by a physical loss. And uh, we think it's a very important thing to look at in uh, extremely volatile markets. So uh, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Susan here. Thanks a lot, Jake. I uh, appreciate yep. you making the time with us today, and uh, and it's very uh, it's it's refreshing to see a transparent view and, and the explanation of, of hedging like that. I I know that uh, I got a lot out of it, and uh, <clears throat> and hope uh, our audience did as well. So I'm sure there'll be some questions here at the end. Um, and, and I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Kathy Ryan, who owns Sandalwood Valuation. Um, she's an accredited uh, appraiser, and, and she's performed uh, numerous uh, appraisals of alternative fuels plants and the machinery and equipment that they hold. Um, she's going to talk to us today about financing uh, in the biodiesel bio industry and uh, bringing her experience to the table here. So, Kathy, I'll flip it over to you for the next part of our panel. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate uh, the introduction and to also uh, thanks to Lee Enterprises. So the experts on our business and finance team work with startup entities quite often, and what we've found is that many projects 
have management teams who want to skip ahead and go straight to construction and operation. This slide uh, that talks about the startup stages outlines the important steps needed to secure funding. Our team can assist not only in making the introductions to investors, but also in making sure that everything is ready before sitting down and pitching your project to those investors. We can assist in several important steps, including feasibility studies and detailed business plans. Risk identification is a key part of preparing your project for financing discussions. Uh, I'll introduce Jeff Kistner's background later, um, but he and our other funding experts can assist you in identifying, identifying and mitigating risk. This slide is a quick guide to remembering what it takes to attract financing. The five C's are what our team focuses on, character, collateral, capital, capacity, and conditions. So in addition to um, my expertise in doing the equipment and mach machinery equipment appraisals, I'd like to also introduce some of the other experts on our team. Mindy Collier is our grant writer and researcher. She's written five successful grant applications under USDA programs, totaling over a million dollars for projects based in four different states. Mindy wanted me to remind everyone on the program that uh, the deadline for the 2016 grant applications is May 2nd, so it's time to get those applications started. On the next slide, uh, Jeff Kistner is our funding expert, both at the fi pilot funding stage and higher. He successfully raised over a billion dollars for the construction of renewable energy pr plants over the past 10 years. His expertise includes funding for the early stages of development, PP&E, and operating capital. In addition to Lee Enterprises Consulting's ongoing support of clients in plant management, engineering, accounting, and asset management, our legal partners at Sullivan & Wooster in Washington, D.C., serve clients who invest and participate in the energy markets, particularly in clean and renewable energy transactions. Their clients are engaged in virtually all aspects of investment in energy industries, from equity investors, tax equity investors, and lenders, to project developers, hedging counterparties, energy companies, and other industry leaders. Client projects, which vary in size from small scale to utility scale, cut across a wide range of energy sectors, including biofuels. We work closely with attorneys Eli Hinckley, Jim Rathall, and Van Hildebrand at the firm. Some recent examples of Sullivan Worcester's work includes um, they represented an energy investment and management company in its acquisition of several food waste to energy power facilities, which range from 3 to 5 megawatts each. They represented a biofuels refining and trading company in disputes ar arising out of allegedly fraudulent credits generated under EPA's RFS program, <clears throat> and they represented a major trade association in litigation challenging EPA's RFS rulemaking. So, Susan, I'll hand this uh, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I uh, appreciate that. And if anybody has any questions out there about biodiesel financing, um, you know, please, uh, please ask those, and, and Kathy will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. So, so uh, today, what I'm going to talk about, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the financial aspects, and what I'll be talking about is really uh, more of the supply and demand aspects of um, biodiesel, especially as it relates to the renewable fuel standard, and, and I'll look at basically the biomass-based diesel industry performance to date, and then some forward-looking perspective. Um, just a, a few words about Genscape and, and why we're a part of Lee Enterprises. Our mission is really to promote market transparency and efficiency in energy and commodity trades, and we do this by providing better information, information that in many cases industries have not been able to see before. And so we provide this type of information in power, natural gas, NGLs, oil, solar. Uh, we also do this in maritime shipping water and and of course uh, biofuels so we also have a, a successful RFS2 QAP program with uh, participants from every fuel type. We do engineering review services uh, with some of our partners for Lee Enterprises. We also have a, an emerging LCFS credit integrity program that's starting to be very popular, and we do land use verification. But uh, 
today's presentation will really be talking about um, what we've learned from research recently from our supply and demand type information services, specifically focusing on biodiesel. And so today, um, this is how the, the, the short time with you I have today will go. We'll talk about the role of U.S. biodiesel production and meaning RFS2, uh, also the important role of renewable diesel and, and how that factors into the D4 equation uh, in terms of RINs. We'll talk about net imports, and then actually I'll carve out a, uh, some some dedicated time to talk about U.S. imports uh, coming in from Argentina uh, with the Carbio survey program that Scott mentioned earlier coming into effect um, that's had an impact on uh, imports in 2015, and so we want to take some time to look at those in detail. And then I'll present a forward-looking summary, kind of where we are today in meeting the mandate. So. Uh, one thing I want to mention as we get started here is that we prepared, all of us prepared our slides ahead of time. There is some EPA RFS2 data that's come out this week uh, for September 2015. Uh, this data that I'm going to show you today will cover the EPA's data up to August 2015. We haven't had time to uh, to incorporate that uh, yet into this analysis. So Genscape will be following up in November, and I'll let you all know about that when we have uh, uh, the details that include September and possibly the uh, the October data from the EPA. So let's talk about the baseline year to date. This graph should look familiar. Scott presented this graph. This is the EPA's U.S. monthly biodiesel production from 2013 to 2015 on a monthly basis. And I just wanted to uh, to talk about a few things here. Uh, year to date, the EIA shows domestic production through July 2015 at about 715 million gallons. So if you look at 2013 and 2014, you'll see a lot of similarity there in terms of how the biodiesel production progressed over the months and also uh, just the general levels. And 2013 was actually a forward tax credit looking year. 2014 was a retroactive tax credit look, uh, looking year. And then 2015 so far we have nothing. And as Scott mentioned, the market conditions have not been uh, have not been good this year uh, in a lot of the months. But production to date has actually slightly exceeded both the 2013 and, and 2014 years. So the industry has actually produced more this year. Um, and based on the production dynamics in 2014, which are not dissimilar to, to other production years, we would expect about 600 million more gallons to be produced uh, August through December uh, in terms of the statistics. Uh, of course, August and September and part of November and October have already happened, but uh, statistically, somewhere around 1.3 million gallons by the end of the year. As you can see from the graph, uh, a lot of biodiesel is typically produced in the latter half of the year compared to the former. So biodiesel is not the only contributor. Um, let me go back a slide here. Biodiesel is not the only contributor to the the biomass-based diesel REN pool that's part of RFS. Renewable diesel also plays a significant factor in that. As you can see, we're running at a rate of about 20% based on the EPA's EMTS data through August, and, and that's not at all dissimilar to what we saw in 2013. Um, actually, I wanted to mention that, that there's been some growth in 20. 13, uh, the fraction of renewable diesel was about 15%. So uh, we've grown a little bit in 2014 and very similar performance so far year to date this year. So the renewable diesel that's coming into the United States, um, there's some domestic supply and there's also import supply. Uh, you know, Scott mentioned that briefly in his talk. And so I wanted to talk about how this plays a role in RFS. So, so some of this renewable diesel that's coming in actually um, that that's qualifies for, for D6 RINs. Um, so I wanted to talk about that first. So you see here this chart directly pulled from the EPA's EMTS data showing the, the different categories of RINs for non-ester renewable diesel with an equivalence value of 1.7. So the D6 RINs could have only come from two facilities based on Part 80's fuel list registrants. The Nestle Singapore and Finland facilities are the only ones that are registered to produce D6 RINs. So there's been about 130 million gallons of this fuel that's D6 qualified through August based on EMTS records. And, and usually um, a facility like Nestle is qualified for both D4 and D6. And when it's D6, it's a palm-based product. The feedstock is actually what makes it qual excuse me. 
the feedstock is actually what makes it qualified as a D6 uh, REN product rather than a D4. So, and that's not the only uh, that's not the only material that's come in from Nesty. We've actually seen from our own records about 168 million gallons being shipped here uh, to the United States from Singapore. And there's also another 61 million gallons that have been applied by EMTS records that are not indicated yet by shipping records. And so there are several reasons why that could be. Um, one of those reasons is that it could have be, that Nesty is uh, most likely a a foreign REN generator, which means they generate RENs upon production, and it can take some time to get a ship. Uh, then it takes about 30 days or so for the the fuel to actually get here once it is shipped. Um, it could have been shipped by another party. It could have been blended or reported to U.S. Customs differently. But but all in all, there is you know uh, more D4 gallons uh, indicated by EMT. ETS records than shown by fiscal shipment. So let's talk about the D4 qualified portion of the uh, renewable diesel that's part of the RFS pool. Uh, there's about 213 million gallons in total. Uh, the table below that shows all the different companies that are registered as part of the Part 80 fuels list to produce EV 1.7 renewable diesel with a REN code of uh, D4. So based on Genscape's research, the three with the dots there are the ones that look to have been producing renewable diesel in 2015. That's Diamond Green Diesel, Nesty uh, in Singapore, and the REG Geismer facility, which is <clears throat> in, a, in a restart mode. Altair also may be active, but it looks like they're focusing on jet fuel rather than renewable diesel insofar. So we've talked about domestic production. We've talked about renewable diesel, both uh, coming in for D6 and then also coming in for D4, and then also talked about renewable diesel um, for as part of the domestic pool. So, so now I wanted to focus on imported biodiesel. This chart is just uh, it's an EIA based EIA database chart that shows biodiesel imports uh, through the EIA survey months through July 2015, and you can see the different countries that we imported biodiesel from uh, through the summer. So the, um, the Indonesian shipments you see there, Genscape has determined that according to U.S. Customs records, those are almost all palm methyl ester, and so you can expect the majority of the biodiesel coming in from Indonesia is going to qualify for D6 rents rather than D4 rents. Argentina and Canada are the main contributors to the D4 REM pool for RFS. So excluding Indonesia, you can see there's about 101 million gallons through July 2015 based on EIA data. The census data reports another 29 million gallons coming in of D4 qualified biodiesel for August. And we'll show a little bit more about in depth about Argentina in the future slides. So breaking this all down, here are the contributions by fuel source and import versus domestic. So you've got about 70% of the biodiesel coming in, um, or 70% of the bio, biodiesel qualified for RFS2 is actually domestic biodiesel. And then the other sources are, uh, you know, about 10% each, more or less, from imported biodiesel, domestic renewable diesel, and also imported renewable diesel. And you can look at that by gallons as well, and this will be part of the slide deck I believe you'll be able to download um, at the end of the presentation. So quickly, um, I want to look at U.S. imports from Argentina, and then I'll wrap it up with just a, a quick summary of the supply, the supply balance for the RFS2 D4 category. Genscape actually electronically tracks vessels uh, crossing into areas and ports of interest to capture what's coming in from Argentina. So the picture you see there is actually the San Lorenzo uh, Rosario area where most of the biodiesel comes from, uh, from the United or from Argentina to the United States, and shows those blue boundaries there where we actually watch specific ports, ports and berths for vessels that are leaving. We actually, in addition to, to watching vessels uh, in those areas, we determine product type that are carried by these chemical bulk tankers by looking at the characteristics of the berth where the ship leaves, draft changes, available port data, and destination. So we continue to watch that ship through its journey uh, to forecast the arrival date and then where it lands to forecast what's on the ship, and also uh, we look at the U.S. Customs records. 
The snapshot you see is what one of the things our analysts use. Uh, this is a vessel tracker. It's a company that's owned by Genscape. Um, it's the largest AIS antenna network in the world, and we also supplement that with satellite data to track ships of all types, from fishing vessels to yachts to chemical bulk tankers to crude oil, crude oil tankers. So with this data, we get metadata about the ship. You can see an image there. We also get its type and capacity. And then we get a lot of dynamic data, where it's going, where it came from, where the last port was, where it's planning to go next, uh, the draft and the speed, and also the arrival berth. And so in, in this slide, you can see a track of a ship called the Bow Engineer going from Argentina to the United States in the Gulf Coast area. Uh, you can see the track there on the world map. And then at the bottom, the orange line is actually the speed of the vessel. So you can see when it goes to zero, that's actually when it's arriving at a port. And the shaded area shows the, the draft of the ship and the change in draft, which can often give our analysts insight to whether it dropped off or picked up material. So we can actually use that trace. If you get down to zoom it in, you can actually see the ship arrive at a particular berth. In this case, the bow engineer delivered about 3.5 million gallons to the Westway Terminal in Houston, and that was on September 27th. So we can actually aggregate this data up and we compare it to what the EIA has shown. So in July and September, um, the, there was an increase and a pickup in, in what we saw coming in from Argentina, about 50 million gallons, 50 million gallons over those two months. Um, we expect October to be less. Uh, most of it, I think, is already landed somewhere between 15 and 20 million gallons and, and nothing more on the water that should be arriving in October based on our uh, analytics so far. And, and just to wrap it up here, um, you know, the, the biomass based diesel mandate, we, based on uh, the RVO data through, or based on the proposed RVO and the EMTS data through August, there was only about uh, 500 million gallons that would be needed to meet the biomass based diesel mandate. And based on the, the industry performance, the domestic production alone would likely get us there. And on top of that, we're expecting more imports from Argentina um, and renewable diesel also make a contribution as well as imports from, from other countries as well. And as Scott said, uh, you know, the, these D4 RINs can also be used to meet the total advanced RVO. Uh, through August, there hadn't been, there has not been much, uh, Brazilian ethanol, uh, imported, but as Scott said, that, that it could be on the rise because of some other economic factors, uh, and also D3 RINs could play a part there. But, but it does look like there's still some room for, for D4 RINs to meet that mandate. In short, though, it appears that the, you know, the biodiesel market um, in terms of RFS will be well supplied this year um, and, and it may be close if it has to, if those rents have to be used for a lot of the advance mandate, but, but it still doesn't look like that obligated parties will need to be using their carryover rents from previous years to meet the 2015 mandate. So I will uh, wrap it up there and, and I will flip it back over to Gerald who, who uh, or actually, no, I'm sorry, we're going to do question, uh, questions and, and answer period right now. If you haven't asked your question yet, then, then please, uh, please go ahead and, and uh, send those through and uh, I'm going to just get, get started here. Um, Scott, uh, there's a question that, that came through during your presentation. Uh, it says, please describe what yellow grease is. Well, it's a little bit of a gray area, but uh, so, you know, typically yuco and yellow grease are kind of synonymous. The, the best way I can describe it is yellow grease probably has some animal fat in it or a high majority of it, where yuco should be completely vegetable oil based. They're both higher in FFAs, uh, maybe a little bit higher in MIUs, but uh, yuco should be veg-based and yellow probably has some or a majority animal fat in it. Ah, great, got it, that's, that's very helpful. And, uh, and Jake Moline, um, a question that came through related to hedging, uh, this, uh, this question says that uh, I'm a supply trading manager for biodiesel and biodiesel blends. How do I hedge the biodiesel HO spread risk? Um, for example, the, or for example, B100 biodiesel held in inventory versus biodiesel blends market? That's a very good question. Uh, similar to how corn basis is unhedgeable, um, so is the basis between biodiesel and heating oil. Unless you were to lock that in via a physical contract, um, 
you know, that's something that's going to be left open to the market. So if you wanted to lock in a flat price biodiesel out forward for six months, you could lock in the basis with uh, whoever you're trading with and go long or short the equivalent gallons via heating oil. But unfortunately, there's no biodiesel futures contract. Um, so it's all traded as a basis to heating oil. So that's something that's not necessarily uh, edgeable, I guess. Good question, though. Got it. Thanks for that answer. And, uh, you know, as you were talking about this, uh, you know, one of the things that, that you discussed is uh, how to how to you know, you were talking about the, the capital required to, to do the hedging. You, do you have any thoughts you can share with us about how biodiesel companies address these capital requirements? Uh, you know, something, in, just asking in a general way, not in a, you know, a specific uh, a specific way, but seeing if you had any insight there. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, obviously, the relationship with your bank's a big thing, making sure they understand that if you have, you know, a million-dollar margin call, that's being offset completely by a physical gain on your physical product. Um, that's an important thing for your lender to understand. Even so, you know, biodiesel plants, especially smaller ones, sometimes have a difficult requirement getting the necessary capital to uh, completely run a 100% hedge position. For that reason, uh, you know, Nate here actually was one of the innovators in a program that we call feed stock financing, uh, where INTL FC Stone Merchant Services, the physical trading arm of FC Stone, will help plants in financing that that uh, hedge position. Um, so that if you'd like some more information about that program, you know, reach out to us. Uh, Nate can walk you through the details of that. Great. I think that's helpful in terms of practical information, you know, I mean, in terms of how people execute these kind of things uh, as part of their business. So, so I think that's really, really helpful. Um, and another question that, that came through um, about about feedstocks, and I think, Scott, this one go to you. Uh, do all the biodiesel plants that use soybean oil have the oil delivered, or do some take the soybeans and process on site? Well, you know, there's some there's some integrated operations where they're maybe making oil on site and shuffling it over to a biodiesel plant. But more often than not, the oil's probably delivered. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it does seem like there are some some integrated. Uh, you know, there there are a handful of integrated producers out there. Um, you know, I know we've got one here in Kentucky. Uh, Owensboro Grain is an integrated producer, and they have biodiesel as well as a lot of other products that, that come out of the crushing process. Um, there's a few standalones out there, there that, that there's a few standalones that you have to deliver it into. Well, I'm going to start stop giving you guys all the the hard questions for a minute because I had one that came through for me. So uh, it was basically the question is what do you find is the best way to track biodiesel and ethanol exports on a monthly basis within the EMTS site? Um, and and I think that really is. Uh, it's very difficult to do that in short. I think that, you know, one of the one of the things is that if if there is a physical export, just so some background for, for everybody on the call in terms of the RFS two program, um, if if a product is exported um, outside of the United States and it was previously produced and there were RENs generated for that product, then that product would incur what's called an export RVO, so an export renewable volume obligation for the exporter. And that exporter would be required to retire a number of RENs uh, equivalent to the, the RENs generated for the exported product. The idea being if, if the product is not used in the motor vehicle fuel supply in the United States, then it's not technically um, qualified for, for, for a REN being used for compliance. So, so that's kind of part of the RFS2 rules. Um, and, and there is a certain time limit upon which those RINs are supposed to be retired once the, the volume is exported. And, and I believe, I'd have to go back and look, but I believe the statute something like 30 days. So um, so technically, if a product has had RINs, gen, RINs generated on it and those RINs are are exported, there should be uh, a retirement that would that would show up in the RFS data uh, according to that. Now, the, the problem is, is that 
RINs aren't always generated for products that's intended for export. So if uh, if a producer produces a product and doesn't generate RINs on it, then it could be exported, and then that product would never have to have an exported RVO. So you would not see that come in the uh, the retirements list, um, the, the the data that the EPA produces on those RINs. So. So it's a bit convoluted. It's it's hard to track in and of itself just because the retired RINs are not inclusive of um, you know the the entire export pool. Um, so uh, Kathy, here's a here's a question for you, um, and maybe for some others on the panel as well. So so if a tax credit does come through for for retroactive for 2015 and potentially forward looking in 2016, um, what kind of impact would you expect it to have from the biodiesel industry in terms of, you know, growth, impact, equipment, those kind of things? Oh, thank you, Susan. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. We have seen a, a number of clients, you know, that are kind of waiting to see what happens there before they make some decisions. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw that out to some of the other panel men or, um, members and see if they have any ideas or thoughts on that question. Yeah, Scott. Any, um, you know, you've you've seen this industry for a while react to the ups and downs of the tax credit. So, yeah. I mean, any any thoughts on you know what the impact might be if the tax credit comes back retroactive and potentially for a forward-looking year? Well, retroactive, you know, doesn't do a lot except for the guys that have traded, you know, uh, biodiesel with the tax credit split for this past year or or done their own blending. You know, it, it will certainly. There's there's some people in the industry that are making that bet that it's going to come back. So you know, we've seen the last few years that uh, the large producers that have you know, public earnings, you'll see a a large you know payment that comes back to them for next year. I think you know if a tax credit comes in, it, it's obviously a good thing. It can create some blending margin and and probably incent some production. The big the big driver would be if it becomes a producer's tax credit. Um, if that one does, I think that's a real game changer because you'll you'll uh, no longer incent uh, imported volume. You'll you'll certainly have a, a more domestic feel where the uh, domestic producer is going to have an advantage over some of these foreign producers. But yeah, I mean our industry is still fairly immature. Um, the tax credit is very helpful, and as you can see this year, without it being in place, uh, times can be difficult. It's a, it, it would be a very positive thing for it to come back, obviously. Right, right, and and it, that's uh, it's good to bring it back to the tax credit. Actually, uh, uh, one of the things that was on my docket that that I that I trimmed out of the presentation was hoping to get a question on it was the uh, just talking a little bit more on some some background on the tax credit. This question was taking taking it through the credit and how excise tax will be treated down the supply chain and and what markets are most likely affected. That middle part, I'm not quite qualified to to answer. There may be somebody else on the Lee Enterprise team that can talk about that. Excise tax, but but I will say that you know there is um, most likely based on our government affairs sources that it'll probably still be December before there is something that is is passed and and so the market will have the time that time to adjust. Um, you know the good news is it'll still be a dollar and so the value amount will will be the same as it has been in years past, um, all things uh, considered. And so, but it is a good time to educate yourself on changes like like Scott said, if it's a producer's tax credit coming in 2016, um, what that will mean for your business and what it will mean from your downstream buyers and, and just uh, be prepared as much as you can uh, for the change if and when it happens. Um, you know, I think that in, in general, um, you know, the, 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 the change from a blender's credit to a producer's credit, um, you know, based on the information we've seen, um, the original reason for this was to limit it to a smaller number of parties. I think that the National Biodiesel Board has quoted something like 3,500 different parties as blenders that are eligible to take the credit. Um, when you limit it to a smaller number of parties, it helps avoid abuse and, and fraud, um, and that was the original policy reason for the change in the tax credit. And, and there are lots of uh, other motivating factors for Congress in addition to that, uh, you know, limiting the tax credit applicability to U.S. producers um, 
could be popular with uh, with uh, U.S. citizens and and the constituents of our congressmen and women. So that because U.S. producers would be getting those uh, taxpayer dollars and and they would not be going outside of the United States. Um, and that's just you know something that we've 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 heard from our government affairs people as one of the things that that Congress is considering. Um, you know, there there are lots of opinions on what it is or isn't, but but I think it's you know important to, for the industry to collaborate and to be patient. Uh, the ultimate goal would be to retain the tax credit. Uh, and, and to the last part of this question here, what markets are most likely affected? Um, you know, the tax credit actually covers biodiesel as well as renewable diesel and renewable jet fuel. So so domestic markets and 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 you know potentially uh, import markets for 2015, and we'll see how it goes in producers versus blenders in 20. 16, but all those different fuel types would be impacted. So I think we still have a, a few questions out there. Um, you know, I want to want to take uh, one more question here, and then I'm going to flip it back to Gerald, and he's going to uh, basically uh, wrap it up for the day, and and uh, and we'll go from there. So. Uh, this one is for, for Jake, um, and, and, and Scott, feel free to chime in on this too. How are the majority of biodiesel sales contracts pricing terms set? In other words, are they flat price, HO minus some basis, month average against HO? Um, is there a standard for that or, or how those are typically done? Good question. Um, most often, uh, one month out forward will be done via flat price. Uh, beyond that, you're going to be uh, trading it as a basis to heating oil, usually a premium over heating oil, not uh, heating oil minus X. It would be heating oil plus a basis. Um, some are traded as an average. It's not uh, impossible to see that, but uh, you'll also see most biodiesel purchasers uh, a little hesitant to go out further than definitely a year, but usually about six months is about as far as you'll see most most biodiesel traded. Got it. Anything you'd add Got to that, it. Scott? Yeah, no, I think that's that's uh, consistent with what we've seen. Great, great. Well, uh, I I appreciate uh, appreciate all the the great answers uh, to the questions, and, and certainly we appreciate our attendees today for asking those questions. I really think it helps enrich the webinar when we can get you know specific questions and have some discussion uh, after the fact from the prepared material. So uh, I'm going to flip it back over to uh, to Gerald, um, and Gerald, uh, if you want to take us home, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I want to thank you for hosting the webinar today, and for all the speakers for what I certainly found to be a professional and informative presentations. If you wish to contact any of these experts or other ones within Lee Enterprises, it can be done through their website, our website, and some of the addresses are shown here. This concludes our webinar for today. I wanna to thank you all for attending, and we hope that Lee Enterprises Consulting gets the opportunity to help make your future biodiesel projects a success. Thank you very much for joining us.